What did Jesus really says part 6. 1.2.4, Worship me. You say that, what makes Jesus stand out from all other religious figures is the nature of his claims about himself. He claims the prerogatives of God, the rightful object of a person's supreme allegiance, and receives without censure the worship and obedience of those who believe. Let us study the validity of this claim. Muslims believe that a Muslim is rewarded for every single hardship he endures during his lifetime and that each hardship endured is used by God Almighty to erase a previous sin by this individual. Even something so simple as a pinprick is counted to this end. How much greater the reward for a man who endured paralysis? His reward may very likely be the forgiveness of all of his sins. If Christianity believes that forgiving sins is a sign of divineness then what are we to say about the many millions of people in the Christian clergy who accept people's confessions and forgive? Their sins? Are they all the offspring of God and part of the Trinity? Do they call God on the telephone and ask His permission to forgive each individual or do they have the power to forgive sins? In the five Gospels, written by 24 Christian scholars from some of the most prominent U.S. and Canadian universities around today, we read on page 44. Stories of Jesus curing a paralytic are found in all four narrative Gospels, the Johannine version, John 5. 1-9, differs substantially, the controversy interrupts the story of the cure which reads smoothly if one omits vv. 5b10, Mark 2, and it is absent in the parallel of John, scholars usually conclude, on the basis of this evidence, that Mark has inserted the dispute into what was originally a simple healing story, if the words are to be attributed to Jesus. V tenth of May represent a bold new claim on Jesus' part that gives the authority to forgive sins to all human beings. The earliest church was in the process of claiming for itself the right to forgive. Sins and so would have been inclined to claim that its authorization came directly from Jesus. We have already spoken about the term Son of God and its true meaning as understood by the people of that time. What we want is a claim by Jesus himself where he says worship me just as God Almighty says for instance in Isaiah 66. 23 And it shall come to pass, that from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me. Saith the Lord. Show us where Jesus, peace be upon him, does the same. Once again, the claim in John 8. 56-59 Before Abraham was born. I am is not the same as worship me. The fact that Jesus, peace be upon him, was present before Abraham is not the same as him saying worship me. What then would we say about Solomon Proverbs 8. 22-31, and Melchizedek, Hebrews 7-3, who were present not only before Abraham, but also before all of creation. With regard to your comparison of I am in the verse of Exodus with that of John. Please note that just because the English translation of these verses is performed such that they become the same English words does not mean that the original words are the same. The first is the Greek word ami, ami, while the second is the Hebrew word haya, hayua. While both can be translated into English to mean the same thing, they are in actuality two distinctly different words. The exact same Greek word is translated as it is I in Matthew 14 27 and is simply I in Matthew 26 22, etc. Notice how people are driven in a chosen direction of faith through selective translation? Also remember that Jesus did not speak Greek. Show us his actual words. Is it so hard to bring us one clear verse like the above verse of Isaiah 66 23 wherein Jesus, peace be upon him, also says worship me? Why must we infer? If he is God or the Son of God then this is his right. The Bible should be overflowing with verses where Jesus commands his followers to worship him, where God commands mankind to worship his Son, where God threatens those who do not worship his Son. And so forth. The Bible is overflowing with verses like this from God about Himself, and from Jesus about God, but there are none from Jesus about Himself. Why is it necessary for God Almighty to ask for people to worship Him while Jesus is not required to do the same? With regard to John 9 38 Lord. I believe, and He worshipped Him. And Matthew 28. 17 They saw Him, they worshipped Him. Please note that the word translated as worshipped in both verses is the Greek word proskuneo, proskuneo, which literally means, and I quote, to kiss, like a dog licking his master's hand. Go back and check the Strong's Concordance for this word. Is the act of kissing someone's hand the same as worshipping him? Once again, selective translation. The whole episode of Doubting Thomas is also now recognized as a later insertion. Not by Muslims, but by the West's own erudite Christian scholars. The five Gospels, mark this passage as being a complete fabrication and not the word of Jesus, peace be upon him, look it up. You say, does Jesus say, I am God? No. I am glad we agree. Because that would have been misunderstood. Jesus is not the Father, as it would have been thought, Jesus is the Son. What? Are you claiming that Jesus is incapable when telling his disciples worship the Father to add the words, and the Son? Are you claiming that the people he is talking to are incapable of comprehending that one is the Father and one is the Son? Would you have us believe that his twelve apostles were so dense that they could not comprehend the difference between a Father and a Son? 
Are there no words in his language to say I am not God but his son, worship both of us? When you claim that Jesus, peace be upon him, died on the cross, do you misunderstand this to mean that God the Father is the one who died on the cross? With regard to the miracles of Jesus being proof of his Godhead please read my comments about other prophets and their miracles, chapter 2.2.3. What you appear to be trying to say is that the fact that Jesus never told anyone to worship him nor claimed to be God but left it up to them to surmise by themselves as proof that he wanted them to worship him? God must ask for worship, but Jesus, peace be upon him, receives it without censure without asking for it? With regard to the opening verses of John, they have already been dealt with in detail. Jesus, peace be upon him, never in his lifetime told anyone to worship him. It was others who did that. Quite the contrary, whenever Jesus, P-B-U-H, spoke of worship, he always attributed it to God and never himself, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve Luke 4 8. Notice the words, him only. Jesus did not say us only, or him and I only. How could he possibly make it more clear than that? What abstract meaning are we now going to concoct for this verse to show that what Jesus really meant was worship both of us? The problem with many apologists is that they interpret the words he and him to mean we and us when it suits them, and to mean he and him only when it suits them. In cases such as Luke 4 8, they claim that him really means us. But in cases where God begets Jesus, or where God sacrifices Jesus, him and he is God alone and does not mean us and we. Notice the trend? Want more? Jesus saith unto her, Worship the Father John 4 2. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him John 4 23. Notice, worship the Father, not worship the Father and the Son. Also notice, worship him not worship us. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Matthew 7 21. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Matthew 22 37. In the Bible we find many verses to this effect, Exodus 34 14 For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Psalms 81 9. There shall no strange God be in thee, neither shalt thou worship any strange God. Deuteronomy 6 4 Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Well, what shall we then say to those who say, I do not believe in a trinity but I do believe that Jesus was a God, or the Son of God, believe me, some people have actually said this. Actually, this is refuted quite simply. If Jesus, peace be upon him, was a God then there are at least two gods, and this contradicts many verses to the contrary in the Bible, the ones we have just mentioned, for example Isaiah 43 10-11. We shall soon see how it was exactly this problem which forced the followers of Paul to later concoct the Trinity doctrine in order to validate their claims of Son of God. If Jesus is one face of a Trinity and the Trinity is one God not many, and Jesus died on the cross, then this one God, the Trinity, is the one alleged to have died on the cross. It also follows that if Jesus and God are one and the same, definition of the Trinity, then anyone who sees Jesus has seen God, however, John 1. 18 says no man hath seen God at any time. When people love God with all thy mind they can't help but keep coming back to the same conclusion, that God Almighty is the only God anywhere. That he has no physical, begotten sired, etc., sons. That Jesus, PBUH, was only an elect messenger of God, and that to enter heaven one must only keep the commandments. This is exactly the message of the Quran. And this is the true inspiration of God. Many will say to me, Jesus, in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Matthew 7 22. 1.2.5, Historical Origin of the Trinity Myth. Who say, most proofs against the traditional teachings of Christianity consist of putting one passage of Scripture against another. Should it not be impossible to pit one verse of the Bible against another? Should the verses of the Bible not be consistent? Should they not reinforce each other rather than refute each other? What kind of logic is this? Your own Bible bears witness that a false witness will always result in discrepancy, Mark 14 56. And almost always taking such passages out of context. Go back to such verses as I and my father are one and see whether Muslims or the church quote the Bible out of context. Show us where our previous comments have taken biblical verses out of context. Is it Muslims or the church who are constantly trying to explain the verses of the Bible through abstract meanings? If the Bible had remained 100% the Word of God then it would be impossible for its verses to contradict each other, however. If mankind has been taking liberties with the words of God then the verses will indeed contradict themselves. Why do these people not reflect over the Quran and study it until they realize that it contains no differences or inconsistency, so that they can accept the truth of what you brought?
Had it been from anyone other than Allah, they would have found inconsistencies in its rulings and differences in its meanings. The Quran, Al Nisa 4, 82. Why not apply the same test to the Bible? The Christian message about Jesus revolves around three facts the Incarnation, the Crucifixion, and the Resurrection. Have we now totally given up on such matters as the Trinity, the Original Sin, the Atonement, and so forth? We have already disproved all of these. Proof from the Bible or otherwise that any one of these three things are not true, and like a three legged stool, the truth of the message would collapse. Is your stool still standing? Or can Christianity still stand without a Trinity, a Divine Son of God, an Original Sin, and an Atonement? If you would like, you can find many serious discrepancies in the narration of the Crucifixion and many other matters in Ahmed D. Dot's books The Choice, and Crucifixion or Crucifixion. As well as his many other publications, you may get a sample from Chapter 3.2. Someone may now say, if the Trinity was not revealed by God Almighty or Jesus, peace be upon him, then why does Christianity believe in it? The answer lies in the Council of Nicaea of 325 CE. In the New Catholic Encyclopedia, with all its seals of approval, 1967, p.295, we get a glimpse of how the concept of the Trinity was not introduced into Christianity until close to 400 years after Jesus. It is difficult in the second half of the 20th century to offer a clear, objective and straightforward account of the revelation, doctrinal evolution, and theological elaboration of the mystery of the Trinity. Trinitarian discussion, Roman Catholic as well as other, present a somewhat unsteady silhouette. Two things have happened. There is the recognition on the part of exegetes and biblical theologians, including a constantly growing number of Roman Catholics, that one should not speak of Trinitarianism in the New Testament without serious qualification. There is also the closely parallel recognition on the part of historians of dogma and systematic theologians that when one does speak of an unqualified Trinitarianism, one has moved from the period of Christian origins to, say, the last quadrant of the 4th century. It was only then that what might be called the definitive Trinitarian assimilated into Christian life and thought, emphasis added. Jesus, peace be upon him, John, Matthew, Luke, Mark, all of the apostles, and even Paul, were completely unaware of any Trinity. So what did exactly happen in this 4th century CE? Let us ask Mr. David F. Wright, a senior lecturer in ecclesiastical history at the University of Edinburgh. Mr. Wright has published a detailed account of the development of the doctrine of the Trinity, in Erdman's Handbook to the History of Christianity, in the chapter on Councils and Creeds. We read, Arius was a senior presbyter in charge of Bacchales, one of the twelve parishes of Alexandria. He was a persuasive preacher, with a following of clergy and ascetics, and even circulated his teaching in popular verse and songs. Around 318 CE, he clashed with Bishop Alexander. Arius claimed that Father alone was really God, the Son was essentially different from his Father. He did not possess by nature or right any of the divine qualities of immortality, sovereignty, perfect wisdom, goodness, and purity. He did not exist before he was begotten by the Father. The Father produced him as a creature. Yet as the creator of the rest of creation, the Son existed apart from time before all things. Nevertheless, he did not share in the being of God the Father and did not know him perfectly. We are told in this book that before the 3rd century CE the three were separate in Christian belief and each had his or its own status. Terulian, a lawyer and presbyter of the 3rd century church in Carthage, was the first to use the word Trinity when he put forth the theory that the Son and the Spirit participate in the being of God, but all are of one being of substance with the Father. About this time, two separate events were about to lead up to the official recognition of the Church by the Roman Empire. On the one hand, Emperor Constantine, the pagan emperor of the Romans, had a son named Crispus. Crispus was a handsome, charismatic, and brave young man who was the popular hero of the Roman people. His popularity grew to such an extent that he began to pose a serious threat to the rule of his own father, Constantine. Therefore, Constantine had him killed. The people were outraged, so in order to cover his tracks, Constantine placed the blame for the death of Crispus on his son's stepmother and had her killed too. The people were now thrown into a great fury. Constantine had just made a bad situation much worse. He decided to seek forgiveness in the temple, but was told that no forgiveness could be granted for such an action. Finally he resorted to the church. They told him that forgiveness could be his through repentance. Thus, Constantine found salvation in the church. He now began to look to the church for support in shoring up his rule of the Roman Empire. On the Christian front, controversy over the matter of the Trinity had just blown up in 318 between two churchmen from Alexandria, Arius, the deacon, and Alexander, his bishop. Now Emperor Constantine stepped into the fray. In 325 CE, the pagan Roman Emperor Constantine was faced with two serious controversies that divided his Christian subjects. The observance of the Passover on Easter Sunday, and the concept of the Trinity. 
Emperor Constantine realized that a unified church was necessary for a strong kingdom. When negotiations failed to settle the dispute, the emperor called the Council of Nicaea in order to resolve these, and other matters. The council met and voted on whether Jesus, peace be upon him, was God or not. They effectively voted Jesus into the position of God with an amendment condemning all Christians who believed in the unity of God. There is even extensive proof that most of those who signed this decree did not actually believe in it or understand it but thought it politically expedient to do so. Neoplatonic philosophy was the means by which this newly defined doctrine of Trinity was formulated. One of the attendees, Apuleius, wrote I pass over in silence, explaining that those sublime and platonic doctrines understood by very few of the pious, and absolutely unknown to every one of the profane, the vast majority of the others signed under political pressure consoling themselves with such words as The soul is nothing worse for a little ink. They then approve the doctrine of homoousius meaning of co-equality, co-eternity, and consubstantiality of the second person of the Trinity with the Father. The doctrine became known as the Creed of Nicaea. The matter was far from settled, however, despite high hopes for such on the part of Constantine, Arius and the new bishop of Alexandria, a man named Athanasius. Began arguing over the matter even as the Nicene Creed was being signed, Arianism became a catchword from that time onward for anyone who didn't hold to the newly defined doctrine of the Trinity. Athanasius, the bishop who is popularly credited for having formulated this doctrine, confessed that the more he wrote on the matter, the more his thoughts recoiled upon themselves and the less capable he was of clearly expressing his thoughts regarding it. After the Council of Chalcedon in 451, debate on the matter was no longer tolerated. To speak out against the Trinity was now considered blasphemy and earned stiff sentences that ranged from mutilation to death. Christians now turned on Christians, maiming and slaughtering thousands because of a difference of belief. Worship of the Roman sun god was very popular during this period. Emperor Constantine, who presided over the Council of Nicaea, was popularly considered to be the manifestation of the Roman sun god. For this reason, in order to please Constantine, the Trinitarian Church, Defined Christmas to be on the 25th of December, the birthday of the Roman sun god moved Christian Sabbath from Saturday to the Roman Sunday, dies solely. The Holy Day of the Sun God Apollo, see Chapter 3. Borrowed emblem of the Roman sun god, the cross of light, to be the emblem of Christianity. Before this, the official symbol of Christianity was that of a fish. A symbol of the Last Supper, see Chapter 3, incorporate to most of the rituals performed on the sun god's birthday into their own celebrations. Constantine was determined that the masses not think that he had forced these bishops to sign against their will, so he resorted to a miracle of God. Stacks of somewhere between 270 and 4.000 Gospels, one copy of all available Gospels at the time, were placed underneath the conference table and the door to the room was locked. The bishops were told to pray earnestly all night, and the next morning miraculously only the Gospels acceptable to Athanasius, the Trinitarian Bishop of Alexandria, were found stacked above the table. The rest were burned. Arius was quickly condemned and then excommunicated. He was reinstated, but was poisoned and killed by the Trinitarian bishop, Athanasius, in 336 CE. The Trinitarian church called his death a miracle. Athanasius's treachery was discovered by a council appointed by Constantine, and he was condemned for Arius's murder. Constantine had made it an imperial law to accept the creed of Nicaea. He was a pagan emperor and at the time cared little if such a doctrine contradicted the teachings of Jesus, peace be upon him, and the centuries of prophets of God before him who had suffered severe hardship in order to preach a monotheistic God to their people as can be seen in the Old Testament to this day. He just wanted to pacify and unite his sheep. Ironically, Constantine embraced the beliefs of the Arians, was baptized on his deathbed in 337 by an Arian priest and died shortly thereafter. In other words, he died a believer in the divine unity and teachings of the Arians and not the new Trinitarian beliefs of the Pauline sect. This triune God theory was not a novel concept but one that was in vogue during the early Christian era. There was 1. The Egyptian triad of Ramses II, Amon-Ra, and Nut. 2. The Egyptian triad of Horus, Osiris, and Isis. 3. The Palmyra triad of Moon God, Lord of the Heavens, and Sun God. 4. The Babylonian triad of Ishtar, Sin, and Shamash. 5. The Mahayana Buddhist triune of Transformation Body, Enjoyment Body, and Truth Body. 6. The Hindu triad, Trimurti, Abrahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. And so forth. However, it is popularly recognized that the Trinity which had the most profound effect in defining the Christian Trinity was the philosophy of the Greek philosopher, Plato. His philosophy was based on a threefold distinction of, the first cause, the reason or logos, and the soul or spirit of the universe. Edward Gibbon, considered one of the greatest English historians, and the author of Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, generally considered a masterpiece of both history and literature writes in this book. 
His poetical imagination sometimes fixed and animated these metaphysical abstractions, the three archical or original principles with each other by the mysterious and ineffable generation. And the Logos was particularly considered under the more accessible character of the Son of an Eternal Father, and the Creator and Governor of the world. Gibbon. Decline and fall of the Roman Empire. 2. p. 9. Even the practice of promoting men to the status of gods was common among the Gentiles at the time. Julius Caesar, for instance, was acknowledged by the Ephesians to be a God made manifest and a common savior of all human life. In the end, both the Greeks and the Romans acknowledged Caesar as a God. His statue was set up in a temple in Rome with the inscription, To the Unconquerable God. Another man who was elevated by the Gentiles to the status of a God was Augustus Caesar. He was acknowledged as a God and the divine savior of the world. Emperor Constantine was also popularly believed to be the human embodiment of the Roman sun god. And on and on. Is it inconceivable that such people, after hearing of Jesus, peace be upon him, many miracles, of his raising of the dead, of his healing of the blind, would consider elevating him to the status of a god? These were simple people who had become accustomed to countless man-gods, and Jesus had become a legend among them even during his lifetime. No wonder it did not take them long to make him a god after his departure. In the Gospel of Barnabas, Jesus himself indeed foretold that mankind would make him a god and severely condemned those who would dare to do so, see chapter 13. The Bible itself bears witness to the fact that these Gentiles were all too willing to promote not just Jesus, but even the apostles of Jesus to the position of gods, see Acts 14one 14 Moreover, the concept of resurrection was also not a novel one. The Greeks, like many other pagans, worshipped the earth and associated its fertility with the fertility of woman. Many earth mother goddesses arose out of this belief, such as Aphrodite, Hera, and so on. With this earth mother goddess came the concept of a man god who personified the vegetation cycle and often the sun cycle. In the case of Osiris, Baal, and Cronus, he also represented a deceased king worshipped as divine. This man god was always assumed to have been born on the 25th of December so as to correspond to the winter solstice, time of year when the sun is born. Forty days later, or about the time of Easter, he had to be slain, laid in a tomb, and resurrected after three days so that his blood could be shed upon the earth in order to maintain or restore the fertility of the earth and in order to provide salvation for his worshippers. This was a sign to the believers that they too would enjoy eternal life. This man God was usually called the Soter, Savior. This Soter sometimes stood alone, but usually was the third, the Savior or the Savior who is third. This man God would be defeated and usually torn into pieces and his enemy would prevail. At this time, life would appear to have been sucked out of the earth. There would then come a third being who would bring back the dead god, or himself be the dead god restored. He would defeat the enemy. This matter will be dealt with in more detail in Chapter 3, for more also see Islam and Christianity in the modern world, by Dr. Muhammad Ansari. And Bible Myths and Their Parallels in Other Religions by T.W. Doan, and The History of Christianity in the Light of Modern Knowledge, a collective work, Blackie and Sun Limited, 1929. Does any of this sound at all familiar? Is it just an amazing coincidence that Paul's new covenant which he preached to these pagan Gentiles was almost a carbon copy of their established beliefs? Or did God intentionally mold his religion after the departure of Jesus, peace be upon him, in order to closely resemble that of the pagan Gentiles? Remember Paul's own words, For if the truth of God hath more abounded through my lie unto his glory, why yet am I also judged as a sinner? Romans 3 7 Even though the Trinity was formulated in the Council of Nicaea, still, the concept of Jesus was God. Or the Incarnation mentioned above by Mr. J, was not formulated until after the councils of Ephesus in 431, and the council of Chalcedon in 451. The Catholics trembled on the edge of a precipice, where it was impossible to recede, dangerous to stand, dreadful to fall. And the manifold inconveniences of their creed were aggravated by the sublime character of their theology. They hesitated to pronounce that God himself, the second person of an equal and co-substantial trinity, was manifested in the flesh. That a being who pervades the universe, had been confined in the womb of Mary, that his eternal duration had been marked by the days, and months, and years, of human existence. That the Almighty had been scourged and crucified, that his impassable essence had felt pain and anguish. That his omniscience was not exempt from ignorance, and that the source of life and immortality expired on Mount Calvary. These alarming consequences were affirmed with the unblushing simplicity of Apollonans, Bishop of Laodicea, and one of luminaries of the Church. Gibbon, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, Vi. P. Den. Grolier's Encyclopedia under the heading of Incarnation informs us that Incarnation denotes the embodiment of a deity in human form. The idea occurs frequently in mythology. In ancient times, certain people, especially kings and priests, were often believed to be divinities. 
In Hinduism, Vishnu is believed to have taken nine incarnations, or avatars. For Christians, the incarnation is a central dogma referring to the belief that the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, became man in the person of Jesus Christ. The incarnation was defined as a doctrine only after long struggles by early church councils. The Council of Nicaea, 325, defined the deity of Christ against Arianism. The Council of Constantinople, 381, defined the full humanity of the incarnate Christ against Apollinarianism. The Council of Ephesus, 431, defined the unity of Christ's person against Nestorianism, and the Council of Chalcedon, 451, defined the two natures of Christ, divine and human, against Eutychus, 